Okay. All right, now what we're gonna do is talk about protein structure and give you an idea kind of how it forms because uh, we're gonna see how it relates to uh, um, phospholipid bilayers, oil and water, and soap as well. And uh, the key thing here is is that if you know the structure, you can all figure out, often figure out what the thing does, which we talked about before. Um, so proteins are very large molecules, and uh, what they do is they're they're long chains of amino acids that fold, we say, into a final shape that determines uh, its structure. <clears throat> I mean its function. Uh, the typical length of a, a protein is somewhere between 200 and 300 amino acids. Uh, the smallest one that we know of is 15 amino acids long, and the third and largest one is over 35,000 amino acids long, which is huge. And I'll show you some uh, relationships uh, now in terms of... Uh, so here's a slide of relative uh, sizes of molecules and proteins. <clears throat> so if you had a water molecule, with a little dot right here, okay, uh, the typical protein would be about this size right here. And... Um, so, and then the largest protein would be this size here. So, I so these little this circle here represents one of these. So you can see the average protein. We can get several, several of these inside the size of the largest protein there is. So, if for instance, if a water molecule weighed a pound. Um, the smallest protein would weigh a ton. Okay, <laughs> kind of gives you a relationship. So the smallest protein weighs on the order of 2,000 times more than a water molecule. The average protein, like this guy here, trypsin, would weigh 11 tons or 22,000 pounds compared to a water molecule. And that's, so that's the, that's the average protein. The protein that I worked on for my PhD was called ATCAs. And again, if water was weighed a pound, relatively, that molecule would weigh 90 tons, okay? Uh, or 180,000 pounds. So this diagram really doesn't do us justice compared to this dot here. And then finally, the largest protein there is that our body makes is called Titan, appropriate name. Uh, if Again, if a water weighed one pound, one pound is actually about one cup, okay, or actually two cups of water, uh, Titan would be three and a half million pounds or 1.75 million tons. That just gives you an idea how big these molecules are. And look how structured they are. So they're just, they're not, they're huge, but they have incredible structure. And it's always kind of amazing that something this huge, with all this, all these amino acids could have this structure here, any kind of structure. All right, so this, the, this, uh, this is a picture of the largest protein there is. It's called Titan and it's 35,000 amino acids. The typical protein has about maybe 300. So this is um, over 100 times bigger than the average protein. Uh, just for your knowledge, where titan is found, it's found inside your muscles. Okay, uh, so when you get into AMP, you'll to be talking about this actin and myosin sliding back and forth. And your teacher will talk about this little spring here, maybe. Maybe. But that spring is huge. Okay, it's called Titan. Uh, so skip over this for now and skip this. These are just views of what proteins look at if you could um, if you could add a device you could if you looked at both of these things together they would form one image that just to give you a sense that they're really three-dimensional not two-dimensional drawings uh, 
so what we want to look at is what gives a protein a specific unique structure that is what does it give its its three-dimensional shape and then how does it form that shape and we can see that these two actually relate to each other okay so first of all we're going to talk about how a protein chain is made so what you have to do first is link together the amino acids so you can take amino acid number one and link it to the amino acid number two and so forth the way that it's going to take place is the same as uh amidification you're going to take so a protein amino acid has two parts it has an amine and a carboxylic acid the amino of the protein is connected with the carboxylic acid of another amino acid so the mean of one amino acid is going to connect with the carboxylic acid of another amino acid. And then they're going to form an amide, which we're going to call a peptide. And also water is going to be formed. So you're going to see the same chemical reaction as we just saw with amidification. Okay, so this is amino acid number one. And this is amino acid number two. So what happens here here's your carboxylic acid and here's your amine so what's going to happen is the OH is going to pop off the carboxylic acid and the H is going to pop off of the amine and they're going to form water and then these two guys are going to snap together and form basically one molecule that bond that is holding them together is called a peptide bond so this has one amino acid one and amino acid two now these amino acids could be the same or different okay this could be a hydrophobic or polar or nonpolar acid base or special and so could this all right and then what we're going to do is then what you're going to do is you're going to add another amino acid so you have another amino acid connect here knock off the OH, knock off an H, and extend it. So you'll have three amino acids. And so we're going to look at the extension of this chain. Okay, now the, so a protein is made out of a chain of an amino acids, and they will be numbered from one amino acid, one to the end, whatever number that is. And number and they will each one will be a specific amino acid for instance number one might be a serine number two might be a tryptophan number three might be a methionine and so forth so the primary structure of a protein is the number one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so forth and the order of the amino acids like I just said serine pro uh, uh, proline, uh, threonine, methionine, and so forth. And we'll see specific examples of that in a minute. All right, back to the formation of the peptide. So what you do is you start with two amino acids, and what they do is the um, carbox, the amine of one, connects to the carbox of the other, and they form a peptide bond. Now, right there. Okay. And then what happens is another uh, amino acid will come link and form another uh, pep peptide bond. And then another one come and form another peptide bond and so forth. And so you get this growing, 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 growing. Okay. Until you're done making your protein. And so you have your order from 1 through whatever, whatever number, 100, 120, 140. And then each one of these will have a specific R group and maybe alanine, serine, or whatever, okay? And so what the amino primary structure of the amino acid will be the numbering, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the naming of just the side group, like alanine, serine, and so forth. Uh, 
the beginning of the chain will always start with an N, and the end of the protein will always end with a C. So it has starts with a amine or nitrogen end and ends with a carboxyl or carbon end. It's very specific. It has a direction. The direction goes from the N or amine to the carboxyl or carbon. All right, and what it does is it forms this long chain. Okay, so here's the N end. Instead of N, we often call it a terminus, which means N. And at the very end down here, there's a as a carbon at the end, or a carboxyl. Okay. And each one of these balls is an amino acid, and every protein has a unique ordering of these amino acids. And let's take a look at a particular structure. This is of hemoglobin. So this is the primary structure for hemoglobin. So the very first amino acid is valine. You won't have to memorize this, but each one of these is three letter code for our amino acid, our, our side groups. So over on this end, there will be an N sticking off over here, and that goes valine, histidine, so forth. And it goes through 146, and at the end there's a carbon. Uh, this is, there's no other protein in the world or universe that has the same amino acid sequence. So this is uh, a part of its structure, its unique structure, is this ordering of the amino acids. Okay, so the order of the amino acids doesn't really do the job of the proteins. It is the order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so forth, but the order doesn't do the job. So what has to happen is the protein has to become a three-dimensional structure, and that three-dimensional structure will do the job. So proteins have 3D structure, and that shape determines what it does. Okay, this protein here is called trypsin, and what it does is it cuts other proteins. And you can see that this right here looks like a pair of maybe clippers. And so what happens is it grabs a little protein right in here, this spot right here, and it clips the protein. So it this shape determines what it does. So what we want to do, what we want to know is how is it, how do we go from this long chain of amino acids that doesn't have any structure at all to forming this three-dimensional structure? Okay, so we want to know how, how does it go from a primary structure, the long chain, to its final three-dimensional structure. Okay, uh, one of the things about proteins we'll see is, is that they are spherical. And uh, if you remember when we talked about oil and water, when you put oil and water, it forms a sphere. And the reason why it forms a sphere is because water pushes the nonpolar molecules, parts, oil molecules together so that the water molecules can get close to each other. Okay, one of the one of these uh, attributes of a sphere is is that like this here. This is a piece of this is a crumpled up piece this piece of duct tape. And what I would like to ask you is, where is most of the duct tape? Is it on the inside or the outside? And you would notice that it's mostly on the inside. So one of the things about a sphere is, is that you can pack more stuff inside a uh, sphere than you can anything else. So most of this sphere here is inside stuff, not outside. So a sphere 
is made of mostly packed stuff and it has a surrounding stuff as well. And we're going to see how that relates to proteins in a minute, but it's a lot like oil or soap. Okay, so why are they spherical? Well, one, that's because they're in water, and number two, they're mostly nonpolar. All we have to do is think about oil and water, soap and water, and phospholipids in water. And, um, okay, when you put oil in water, what happened is water liked to interact with itself, and so what it did is it pushed the nonpolar oil molecules to the middle. And when that did, did that increase the London dispersion for the oil and they became, they liked each other. And then there were a lot of them stacked, uh, packed in there. And that the more nonpolar molecules that were packed, the better the London dispersion forces. So the packing inside the sphere increased their London dispersion forces. Okay, soap. Okay, so oil then it's the oil just has basically two types of interactions. It has the water holding itself together, and the oil is held together by London dispersion forces. Okay, soap, a lot like oil, what it does is push the nonpolar parts inside the nonpolar tails, and that increases London dispersion forces, and they form a micelle, which is spherical. It increases London dispersion forces, and they have end-to-end -end interactions. So all the ends and the tail, the tail interact through London dispersion forces. <clears throat> but what's different than soap than in water and then oil is soap also can interact with water. So soap can stick in uh, it's a better structure, more stable structure than oil and water, because part of the soap will connect with the water. So here's a dipole dipole. The zigzag line, blue line over here. And forms dipole dipole with water. So soap has uh, three types of interactions, water holding it, the water together, the, um, the tails holding it together uh, end to end through London dispersion forces, and the heads holding each other, uh, holding together with water to a dipole dipole. Okay, for phospholipid bilayers, what happened was similar to soap, you got the nonpolar part, the oily parts got pushed to the middle, and they formed end to end, tail to tail hydrophobic, I mean, London dispersion forces. But the other thing that's stronger than um, with soap is that they also have side-to-side -side interactions. And these side-to-side -side London dispersion forces also help hold again the structure. So not only does it have end-to-end -end like soap, it has side-to-side -side London dispersion forces. And then again, it also has dipole-dipole with water. Okay, so we're going to see how especially with these two, soap and phospholipid, how that relates to the structure of a protein. Okay, so why does, pro why does a protein form its three-dimensional structure? How does it fold, we say? So here's a drawing, maybe of a, uh, a primary structure where the blue are the polar and the black are the nonpolar. And if you notice what I did is, is I told you that most of a protein is nonpolar, so most of this line here is black. Okay, so when you put this in the water, what the water is going to do, it's going to force the black parts together, just like in soap, and they're going to form London dispersion forces. And then the polar amino acids are going to stick on the outside and interact with water. So a protein folds for very similar reasons as soap, forming my cells and phospholipids forming. The nonpolar parts go in the middle, interact with London dispersion forces, and they do it side to side mostly. So there's a lot of side to side London dispersion forces. 
and also the dipole dipole. Now there are some non-polar guys that get stuck on the outside and polar guys that get stuck in the middle and we'll talk about these in a few slides. Okay, this overall structure, this folded structure of a protein is called the tertiary structure. Symbolized as Roman number three with a degree sign. A primary structure is the Roman number one with degree sign. Uh, the tertiary structure is what gives the protein its job, its function. Okay, so for a protein to do its job right, it has to fold properly. And we're going to talk about in a minute what happens if it doesn't fold properly and what would cause it not to fold properly. But what determines the fold of the protein, what determines it to get its shape, is the primary structure. The primary structure, the blues and the blacks, okay, they're gonna they're gonna force the protein to fold it where the nonpolars go in the middle and the polars go on the outside. So the primary structure of a protein determines how the the protein is gonna fold into its tertiary structure. Okay, and again, uh, what we have here is nonpolar amino acids tend to be on the inside, away from water, lots of interactions, mostly like side to side, uh, increasing on the dispersion force. The polar guys stick on the outside, interacting with dipole dipole. Um, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. And some polar molecules get stuck in the inside, and what they do is that they tend to find each other and link up and they will form hydrogen bonds which uh, and, uh, and make secondary structures. And then there's these other two which we're just going to skip over. You don't have to uh, know these for now. All right, so this is basically what you got when you have a protein. So a protein has an oily part in the middle where it has London dispersion forces. It has polar parts on the outside interacting through dipole dipole. Okay, we're also going to see that there's some polar stuck in the middle and we're going to talk about those next. All right, um here's just a picture of a protein. Okay, now the secondary structure. Okay, secondary structure is usually you will usually find it inside proteins. And what it is, is it's usually polar amino acids that get stuck inside proteins. And they form, there's two types that are formed. There's called alpha helix and beta strands. Okay, and the beta strands can, be, can become beta sheets. Just like a bed sheet is made out of strands, um, a beta sheet is made out of strands as well. What's going to hold these together is a hydrogen bond, which we're going to talk about, and that really helps lock in the three-dimensional structure of the protein. So here are the two types, and we have sort of cartoon models of them. So this is the alpha helix, kind of coily, and uh, we don't have it here, but there'll be interactions between like the tips of these guys called hydrogen bonds. Uh, so this is a beta sheet made out of two two strands, and what holds these together is hydrogen bonds. Now they don't; these two do not have to be together like this. Uh, usually, um, we're just showing them together as one unit. But they, this, these can be; in, these are individually separated from these. Usually, okay. What is a hydrogen bond? A hydrogen bond is a special type of dipole-dipole interaction. And um, what's special about it, it uh, happens between, between a hydrogen atom of one molecule and an oxygen or nitrogen of another molecule. So here's an example down here. So here's a hydrogen, dipole-dipole with the nitrogen of another molecule. Here's another hydrogen bond. You have a hydrogen dipole-dipole with the oxygen.
So you won't have to draw these out. You just have to be able to, be able to tell me what a hydrogen bond is. Okay, hydrogen bond is a special type of dipole dipole. And it's a dipole dipole that happens between the hydrogen atom of one molecule and the oxygen or nitrogen of another molecule. So a dipole between a hydrogen atom. And what this does is it really stabilizes these amino acids, polar amino acids that don't want to be inside. It basically helps these guys like each other and stick together and stabilizes them inside the protein. Here's an example of an alpha helix. Uh, this is what it might look like in reality, but when we look at it, the, the actual line structure of it, it will look like a coil. And these dots are the hydrogen bonds. And if you notice, there's a hydrogen to oxygen, hydrogen to oxygen, and so forth. Uh, so, and this is a beta sheet made out of beta strands. So the red is oxygen, the white is hydrogen. Okay, and there, this is a dipole dipole. Okay, again, so let's go over it. So water pushes the nonpolar amino acids to the middle, increasing their London dispersion forces. There's lots of surface area contact between the side groups. Uh, and this makes a lot of side-to-side -side interactions, which increases their London dispersion forces. Okay, the polar amino acids will interact with the water dipole-dipole. Now, some of the polar amino acids get stuck in the middle, and when they do that, they'll form hydrogen bonds, forming secondary structure. And what that really does is it locks in the whole structure. It, like, snaps the whole structure together. If you didn't have these inside a protein, it just, it just kind of be all mushy, okay? But once you put these hydrogen bonds in there, it locks structure in, so now it is very stable. Okay, so here's a picture of it. Um, it's the same picture I showed you before. You have the oil part, nonpolar part, and now you have the secondary structure in the middle, which helps lock in the structure and make this protein very stable. And there's just some pictures. Okay. All right. There's one more type of structure. It's called quaternary structure. Um, and this is when you have more than one tertiary structure or one, more than one fold combined to make a more complex protein. And I'll go over some examples of these. Now, some proteins form quaternary structure, but not all proteins. The protein I just showed you on the previous slide is called trypsin, and it does not form quaternary structure. It exists all as just one fold. Hemoglobin is an example of a protein with quaternary. Okay, now, now let me go back and talk about these words, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. What they mean, primary, they mean types. They don't tell you the number of. So primary doesn't mean one. Okay, it means the first type. Secondary means the second type. Tertiary means the third type. Quaternary means the fourth type. So if I ask you about quaternary structure, don't tell me it's four amino acids or four this or that. What it is, it's the fourth type of protein structure. And what it is, it's when more than one protein fold interacts with each other. And here's an example of a protein with quaternary structure, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, hemoglobin has four folds. Okay. All different, I mean, they're all folded 
separately from each other, but they all come together to form one protein. So hemoglobin does not work unless all four of these come together. Actually, hemoglobin is made out of two, two types of folds, a red and a blue. So hemoglobin has two blues and two reds, and they all four of them come together. And this is called quaternary. Now, the tertiary structure would be just one of them, and the quaternary structure is the whole thing. So here's, here's one of the chains of a hemoglobin. It's not colored. It might be the red or the, uh, well, I guess it's the, the red one. And so there's two of these, and then there's two blue guys, I mean two orange guys. Uh, this is another protein that has quaternary structure. It has two folds, so it has two tertiary structures, and actually they're identical. Um, so this orange guy and purple guy are are exactly the same, and this protein called HIV protease, what it does is it needs two of these identical guys to form one protein. And there's another view of it. Uh, here's another protein that has quaternary structure called tropomyosin. You may have heard of that in AMP. This is a protein I worked on called aspartate transcarbamylase, short ATCase. It's made out of 12 chains, okay? It's made out of uh, these, these three blues, and these, there's three blues, and then there's three purple, and all those all of these are exactly the same so there's six six of these structures here that are exactly the same and then there are six of these structures here that are exactly the same <clears throat> so this molecule here is made out of 12 tertiary structures and there's only two type there's six of each okay but there's 12 all together so the quad, so this protein has quaternary structure. There's another picture of it. Okay, so putting it all together, what you have is your primary structure, which is your amino acid sequence. And the amino acid sequence is going to determine how the protein folds. So all those amino acids and nonpolar and polar guys are going to cause the protein to fold. Uh, because the polar parts get pushed on the outside and nonpolar is pushing the inside and so forth to form the tertiary structure. As a result of the tertiary structure, you will get secondary structure inside the protein. And then sometimes, but not all the time, some of the proteins will need to have more than one tertiary structure, and that's called quaternary structure. And finally, the uh, central theme is, is every protein has a unique amino acid sequence that determines its three-dimensional structure, which includes its tertiary, secondary, and quaternary structure. And that three-dimensional structure determines its job. And so what I have here is a, the protein trypsin. This is the amino acid sequence here. And this amino acid sequence is going to determine what this looks like, to what its fold looks like. And then this fold will do the job, which is to cut up proteins. Okay, um, now back, I said before that uh, a protein has to form, fold exactly right to do its job. There are some times when proteins won't fold right, and if they don't fold right, they won't do their job. An example of that is sickle cell anemia, where a protein has been misfolded, and we'll talk about why it does. But what happens is, is that the hemoglobin, normal hemoglobin forms four, quaternary structure forms four, but for sickle cell, the quaternary structure is quite different. Okay, as you can see, it forms like a lot more of these connections. All right. So 
And why does it do that? It does that because there's been a change in the very beginning, the amino acid sequence. So why does a protein misfold? It'll misfold because the uh, primary structure has changed. Okay, for this case, just one of the amino acids. So if we go back and look at the amino acids, uh, primary structure of hemoglobin, one of the first slides I showed for this, uh, one of those guys, I think it's about a 100 amino acid, 140, gets changed from a GLU to VAL. Just one change, okay? One little change can make this guy misfold. So this tells you how important primary structure is. So primary structure determines tertiary structure, and tertiary structure determines function.